on this computer. So here we are. So we have more or less uh, one minute to go to the official beginning of the lecture. And uh, well, there is not so much to say. Thanks for coming. My name is uh, uh, Nicola Botta. And uh, I'm guest lecturing this week at Chalmers, but I'm not uh, in place there. I'm not in presence at Chalmers. I'm sitting currently in Berlin. And uh, so this is the way that we are going to do this the next two hours and also the two hours on Thursday afternoon. Um, right. So uh, the idea is the following. I'm going to give this lecture essentially as a mixture of uh, book reading, blackboard presentation, and a little bit of Haskell uh, code reading. So I have essentially open, I will have two open windows, the one that you have seen before, and this one, uh, which is a, a Haskell file. I'm going to make available both files um, towards the end of the week, or let's say on Thursday afternoon. Uh, my name, as I said, is Nicola Botta. This is my mail address, uh, Nicola Botta, or just Botta at pickpotstam, pick-potstam.de. Potsdam is like the name of the town, Potsdam in Germany. And uh, um, uh, right, so we are going to have the lectures and you are going to have the exercise sessions today's afternoon and then on Friday afternoon. And I hope that this is going to be more or less enough to clarify uh, most of what uh, refers to week seven and chapter seven of the book. But if you have any question, any problems, just get in touch via mail or ask the teaching assistant and uh, if there are major problems, we can organize some kind of extra sessions. So, uh, right, so let's get started. There are two main goals, two main goals that I'd like to achieve with this lecture. The first one is that you are able to read chapter seven of the book in a kind of comfortable way. There are some pitfalls, some difficulties. It's a kind of long chapter. So I walk you through the chapter and at the same time, try to flag the points or the, the, uh, the points which are perhaps a little bit more problematic and needs a little bit more discussion. But let's say at the end of these four hours, you should more or less be able to read through the chapter without major problems. The second goal, which is perhaps even more important because we are not far away from the exam, is that uh, you acquire some kind of ability of solving exercises. And uh, then, as you know, the, the skill of solving exercising comes from solving exercises. I have, I've solved some of these exercises of uh, week seven. It took me quite some time, but that's the way I learned more or less this, uh, um, this chapter. And this is also the way that you should learn the chapter. Um, we will ha have not have time to go through the exercises during the lecture, but I try to flag some, uh, let's say, to give you some hints and to show you some way of at least get started. And otherwise, as I said, uh, the exercise sections are there for you to ask for help, for example, and uh, uh, for recommendations. So let's get started. So uh, linear algebra and uh, vectors and vector spaces. So the, there is this, uh, perhaps you have seen, let's say in previous uh, courses or at school, this uh, uh, representation of vectors as tuples of numbers. And in fact, vectors are in a certain sense, tuples of numbers. And these numbers have to obey some laws, have to form a field. Um, and this is, if you want, uh, this is a, a very down to the earth representation of the notion of vector, of the inhabitants of vector spaces. And the way we are following here is to abstract a little bit away from this representation, although we, we will go back to it a little bit later, and to look at uh, vectors and, and vector spaces, vectors as inhabitants 
of uh, an algebraic structure, which is called vector space. And here you have to go back to, I think, week four, in which you have already acquired some kind of familiarity with algebraic structure. You have been looking at monoids, uh, at groups, at rings, uh, and uh, they were all defined in terms of a set, some operations, and some properties of those operations. And here, the, with linear algebra, we are extending this small hierarchy of, uh, um, of notions with that of a vector space. And the novelty is that the vector space, as you see here, is something which is parameterized not only on one set, but on two sets. So a vector space consists in a certain sense of a set of vectors, which is usually denoted by V, and a set of scalars. And on the top of that, we have three main properties. So the scalars have to build a field. The vectors have to build an additive group. And there must be an operation between uh, scalars and vectors, a binary operation that takes a scalar, it takes a vector and generates a new vector. And this operation is denoted here by this triangle, and it is often called uh, scale or scaling. Um, perhaps a little bit of notation. So I'm, I have flagged um, in these notes snippets that are code with C. So this C in red that you see here is meant to denote the fact that this is code. And uh, we are going to see other denotation, an S that denotes something like specification, something which is not really an implementation, and then P for properties. But here we have a code, and so we can see that this code is also present at the level of the Haskell file, and it is exactly what is printed there. So if we have a field S, if we have an additive group V, we are entitled to say that these two types form a vector space if additionally there is uh, one scaling or scale operation that take, take a scalar, it takes a vector and gives back a vector. So now, if you do not feel very comfortable with this hierarchy of notions that I've mentioned from week four, just go back, I've spliced in here the relevant part there is this graph that gives more or less the, the structure of this notion, the mutual relationship between this notion. And another element which is going to be important for this lecture and in general for exercises and exams are these kind of uh, higher order predicate or higher order function that uh, um, are used to encode the notion of homomorphism. So we are going to use them uh, more or less immediately. And uh, the other important thing that you have to keep in mind is that in spite of the fact that in this diagram, uh, this notion of characterized just in terms of operations, uh, we also have properties, we have axioms. Um, so for instance, in a ring, the multiplication is supposed to distribute over the addition. And in much the same way as uh, in the hierarchy that you have uh, learned in week four, there are properties that these operations are meant to fulfill. So here too, there are properties that uh, uh, this scaling, this multiplication between scalars and vectors are meant to fulfill. And these properties are uh, summarized uh, here. So there are essentially three properties and we are going to go a little bit through the reading of these properties. Um, so there are three properties that uh, uh, have to be fulfilled for let's say a set of vectors and a set of scalars with a, a scalar vector multiplication to form a vector space. So the, the first property is the one flag tier, it says that vector scaling, so scaling with S, and this is a function 
that goes from v, from v to V, from vectors to vectors, is a homomorphism over the additive group structure of V. So now the thing is like that, when you are reading, when you are reading something like that, a very good exercise, if you are reading, let's say on the physical book, if you are reading on the physical book or on a printout of the book. So a very good exercise is just to cancel out the uh, definition, or if you want the formalization of this property, and to ask yourself, what does it mean to say that vector scaling, that this multiplication with the scalar S um, is a homomorphism from and to the additive troop structure of V. And uh, so just make this exercise and then you know, and then if you are not able to answer this question, you just go back and you lift your finger and you look at the definition, but try first of all to make yourself clear what it means and what these laws are. In this case, we have like these three laws that the usual one that S multiplied with the sum of A and B has to be the sum of S times A and S times B. And then the corresponding laws for the, um, for the unary and uh, for the nullary uh, operation. So for the zero, for the unit of the addition and for the negate operation. So the other things that is going to be very useful for you is to ask yourself, what are the types? So for instance, what is the type of the addition here on the left and on the right hand side? Here in the first example, it is addition between vectors. But perhaps in other cases, the addition is not the same on the left and on the right hand side. And for the second properties, for instance, scaling a vector, Again, you see that the text is not giving explicitly the type, so it's your obligation to ask yourself and to answer the question, what is the time of scaling with V? And the same apply for the third property. Um, you have seen this way of formulating in a very compact way uh, the properties in terms of the H0, H1, and H2 predicates. Now, so for instance, this first one would be something like H2, and we would have uh, multiply with S plus and plus. So again, it's a good exercise to ask yourself how to rewrite these laws in terms of the higher order predicate H1, A0, and H22 that you have learned from, um, from week four. So uh, just make sure that you feel comfortable with these three laws, that you understand what they mean, that you can answer the question, what are the types of the operators involved? And you if you have any troubles, just ask this afternoon in the exercise session uh, or just send me a mail. This is something that uh, should be uh, clear to you. So this is the thing. So we have a set of vectors. We have a set of scalars. We have the requirements that uh, the scalars form a field, that the vectors form an additive group, and that the scalar vector multiplication fulfills these three laws. So this is the notion of a vector space. And then, uh, so the first idea or the first example that we have in the text is that of an instance of vector spaces, which just consist of the scalar themselves. So every time we define a notion in terms of, uh, uh, of an algebraic, structure or of a type class decla declaration. We want to make sure that, you know, it is, not, it is not empty, that we have example, that we have instances of this, uh, of this type class. And so the first example is vector space SS. So yes, uh, S and S, so the pair, uh, the two types, S and 
with itself, so as a scalar and as a vector, form a vector space. And they do so because of the fact that we can define the multiplication to be the standard multiplication between scalars. And because of the fact that uh, the, um, the context, the condition field S implies that uh, uh, S is also um, an additive group, uh, which is the second requirement that we have here for vector spaces. So this is, this is, if you want, the first example, perhaps trivial. Um, and we are going to make more example in the course of this lecture. So the second paragraph of, uh, um, of this introduction is about basis and representation. And here comes something which is quite important. Um, so again, as a, as a small recommendation, as an exercise, for instance, you could try to show um, that uh, the pair SS form a vector space if S is a field. So you could try to show the lows 1.1, 1.3, 2.1, 2.3, 3.1, and 3.2 for these special cases. And to answer the question, what, for instance, justifies saying that the multiplication of S with the sum of P and Q is in fact the sum of S times P and S times Q. So this is very small exercise, just to uh, exercise a little bit this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, reasoning. Um, right, basis and representation. So this is, this is a kind of important point. Um, so the idea is following. We have this notion of vector space with all these properties. And there is a claim here. And the claim here is that uh, because of these properties, um, we can always represent a vector in terms of uh, uh, a fixed sector, uh, a, a fixed set of so-called basis vectors. So this is something which is perhaps a little bit surprising, but uh, if you think in terms of the interpretation that we have started with as vector as tuples of, uh, um, of numbers, this is in fact quite natural. For instance, here I have represented in this picture a vector V, which is the sum of the two canonical vectors E1 and E2. In fact, it is E2, E1 plus two times E2. And it is also the sum of two other vectors that I've called P1 and P2. There is in the next page uh, a more detailed example of this situation. So the idea is that th this is a claim in a certain sense. It, 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 we would need a proof for this claim. And the proof is in, in fact Gauss elimination uh, as a method for solving linear systems of equation, but this is not something that we are going to discuss. But the claim is that for every, the claim is in this first sentence that for every V, for every element, for every vector of a vector space, there exist coefficient S0, Sn such that V is equal to the sum of this coefficient times the basis vector. And the condition for this uh, uh, representation to exist is that uh, the basis vector are basis vector. And that means that they are linearly independent and that they spend the whole space, which is more or less tautological equivalent to say that every vector can be represented as a linear combination of this basis vector. Um, so we do not discuss further the existence, but you will see that uh, uh, the condition for the existence in an exercise, and you will see that linear independence is sufficient for granting the existence. And uh, the uniqueness is discussing this short proof that uh, you should have no problem in reading. So the fact that vectors can be represented as tuples uh, or as list of scalars 
um, means that we have a kind of syntax for this notion of vectors. Even if vectors are perhaps functions of polynomials, or as we see, we will see later uh, other entities, we can represent them as tuples of scalars. And here is a very small example uh, with numerical values for those vectors that I have pictured in the previous page. So V is equal to the sum of one uh, times the canonical vector E1 plus two times the canonical vector E2. And it is also equal to the sum of these two other vectors with coefficient one and one. Um, for those of you who have uh, already had some kind of introduction to linear algebra, it is useful to keep in mind that at the core of this idea of linear independence and of vector spaces, there are three propositions that can be shown to be equivalent. Namely that a set of vectors are linearly independent, B0, Bn are linearly independent, that uh, uh, the matrix whose columns are this vector has a full rank, n plus one in this case. And uh, the fact that the linear system of equation B times S is equal to V has a unique solution. This is not something that it is very much relevant for, uh, let's say, for the exercises and uh, for the exam, but that's something that is usually to keep in your mind if you have some kind of a prior prior knowledge about linear algebra, which I suppose you do. So we are uh, short before uh, making a short break in recording. Um, canonical basis. So I have mentioned this idea of canonical basis, and so we have here a characterization first, an informal characterization of canonical basis. So um, EK is the vector that is everywhere zero expect, except at position K. So this is an example of canonical vector as tuples of numbers. So uh, the other thing that I would like to remark is that uh, um, this idea of components, this idea of we have seen there is a unique decomposition for every basis, there is a unique decomposition, but uh, uh, as it is often the case that some bases are in a sense better than other bases and the canonical uh, basis. So the basis that consists of vectors which are everywhere zero except at one position has, uh, um, has this, uh, uh, peculiarity that uh, the components, so the i the ith component, the ith component of a vector v represented as a tuple of number according to this view that we have seen and that we know to exist is equal to the ith coefficient only in the canonical basis. So here we see for instance, v0 is a coefficient is, is a component and it is at the same time, the first coefficient in the canonical basis. This is not the case if the basis is non-canonical. Um, so there is a first exercise here, which is 7.1 that requires to, to define a function that takes as input a vector and a set of non-canonical uh, basis vectors and returns the coefficient. So this is not uh, going to be really a function uh, that you can implement, but it is rather going to be a specification. So how does, how does the solution of such a problem look like? So the problem of finding uh, a representation in a given basis, uh, given that basis and given the vector. So this is something that uh, if you look back to the previous slide, uh, it shouldn't be very difficult to uh, solve or to answer. So let me just at this point make uh, uh, a short break in recording. <laughs> 